What is up heroes, this is Minite Zero, welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton and the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, another bonus episode, we went through some of the weekly puzzle challenges. And thank you again to Mario x Mega Man, or is it Mega x Mario? Ah, which one is it? <laughs> Let me check. I don't want to mess that up. Um, but we went through some of the weekly puzzles, which were actually quite fun. They varied quite a bit in the amount of time it took for us to get through them. No doubt about that. Um, but there was one of them that actually gave me a lot of trouble, and admittedly, I didn't actually spend a lot of time between these episodes. I felt like getting back into the puzzles, so I haven't taken a whole bunch more time to think about it, but I will eventually and come back to it. But I think it's Mario X Mega. Yes, thank you, Mario X Mega. And I'm eager to hop into the next set of puzzles, so without further ado, let's, let's hop into the clock's chime. I wonder what that one's gonna be about. Puzzle number 11. There is a clock tower that rings the time on the hour every hour. However, this clock tower is special in that it rings the time out very slowly. Each ringing of the bell takes a full five seconds. Now to the problem. When the time is 12 p.m., the bell rings 12 times. How many seconds does it take for you to hear the time? So... 12... Five times, right? Uh, that would be a that would be a full minute. There's got to be something in the wording here that I'm that's a little bit trickier, right? There's a clock tower that rings the time on the hour every hour. However, this clock tower is special in that it rings the time out very slowly. Each ringing of the bell takes a full five seconds. There's 12 p.m. The bell rings 12 times. How many seconds does it take for you to hear the time? I mean, I'm tempted to say 60 seconds, but but that seems too obvious. There's got to be some twist to it, right? I think I'm having a poor understanding of what it means to ring the time out very slowly, or to ring the time out at all. When the time is 12 p.m., the bell rings 12 times. How many seconds does it take for you to hear the time? So I, I guess like how I'm picturing this is every hour, the bell is going to ring a certain number of times for what hour of the day that is. And so presumably somebody listening would hear the number of rings of the bell and then know what time it is. So I'm thinking you would need to listen to all 12 rings in order to do so. I feel like there's either, it, it's either the very obvious 60 seconds, five times 12, right? You need to hear all 12 rings in order to to do it or you already know what the time was the last time the clock tower rung so when you hear it ring again you immediately know what time it is that's what i think it might actually be going for but then if that's the case Would it be five seconds for one full ring, or would it just be, I don't know, one second for the start of a ring, right? Because I think that's also a valid argument, right? You could know the time if you knew the previous time, right? And start to hear the bell ring again, you know it's been an hour. And you thus know what time it is. So you don't need to listen to all 12 rings in order to know what time it is. When the time is 12 p.m., it's noon. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I can think of much else to really throw at this problem. I 
So it's either five seconds in my head or, or 60 seconds in that after one ring, you already, when you hear the first ring, you know that it's now been an hour since the last time you heard the time, which would thus give you the time, or it's 60 seconds for you hear all 12 rings fully, and thus you know. Hmm. Or I guess actually one other aspect you could say is, let's, let's presume somebody has no knowledge of what the time is. They need to know when it stops ringing, right? So after 12, after 60 seconds, the bell has rung 12 times, but we don't know that it's going to ring or not going to ring again. So theoretically, you could say 61 seconds <laughs> um, would be the time necessary to know that there were 12 rings and it stopped ringing, right? I don't know which the, which the game really wants me to answer, but those are, I think, Honestly, all valid answers. I actually like the first and the last, you know, either 5 seconds or 61 seconds better than 60 seconds. I guess the other thing is, does the ringing, is the ringing continuous for the full five seconds, right? Or would it have to be 65 seconds to know that it didn't ring a 13th time? So is it going to want 61 seconds or 65 seconds? I actually think that's the answer they're going for. Basically it needs to ring 12 times and then you need to know that it doesn't ring a 13th time. At what point do you know that it's not ringing a 13th time though, right? The way I think about it is, every five second interval, on the first second of that interval, they're going to start ringing the bell, and it takes a full five seconds to, I don't know, ta taper off or, or, or prepare the next ringing procedure or whatever it is. Um, that's, that's kind of the impression I get. So I would think that on the 61st second, you wouldn't know what it is, or you would know that there wasn't going to be another ring. So I think I'm actually going to go with 61 seconds, and then my, my second guess would be 65 seconds. And then I'd kind of get to the cheekier 5 seconds, right, where you technically only need to hear one ring. But then, given what I was just talking about with how the ringing during that 5 second interval works, would you just say 1 second then, right? All you need is 1 second of the first ring to know that uh, it's been an hour since the last time you heard the time and had it confirmed, right? So I'm going to go with 61. We'll see. Either way, I feel pretty comfortable with how I've thought through the problem, and I think there are a few different angles you could take well, here's my that guess. could use some clarification. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not surprised. I was sure I had it. If you could get the right solution by just multiplying information given to you, this wouldn't be a puzzle. It'd be math class. I, I know that. <laughs> so we'll try 65 to see if maybe that's the aim they were going for. But... We'll, we'll see. If that's not it, maybe there is something I'm completely missing to this puzzle. I'd be, I'd be really bummed if <laughs> I was losing pick rats over I a question like this. That's not it either. Oh, I was sure I had it. I was sure I had it indeed. Okay, so they'll go. There goes my first two guesses. Hmm. I guess one other angle, if they're getting really cheeky with the wordplay, how many seconds does it take for you to take to hear the time? Technically, like zero seconds in terms of once the time is is cr given. How long does it take for you to hear that time after it's been established? You know, zero seconds really, just given the speed of sound. <laughs> Um, maybe that's what they're trying to be clever about. 
Do I want to guess one second? Do I want to guess five seconds? Or do I want to get a little bit more clarification with a hint? Maybe, maybe it is the zero. Or the five. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try those. I think, I think you can make a good argument for these answers. How does this sound? But I feel like I'm more in the boat I'm so of embarrassed. trying to get in the, the head of the puzzle creator, trying to figure out what they want, more than trying to actually come up with the solution. So we'll try we'll try zero, and um, see if that works. And if not, then we'll go with a hint. I'm, I'm glad I can actually be a little I bit more free with trying answers, not having to worry about pick rats at I've least, because I think that would make this quite a bit more frustrating. So we'll give a hint to go, and maybe that'll help us understand what angle we should be taking to approach the problem. Let's see, the bell will ring 12 times and there are 5 seconds between each sounding of the bell. It sure sounds simple, but there's at least one step everyone overlooks at first. Think about what needs to happen in order for you to realize it's 12 o'clock. Wait a minute, each ringing of the bell takes a full 5 seconds. But this is saying the bell will ring 12 times and there are 5 seconds between each sounding of the bell. Did I try 65? So now that I think about it like this, where it's 12 rings with five second intervals between those rings, it's a little bit different, right? If they're gonna be 12, well, if they're essentially then gonna be 11 55 second intervals, or 11 five second intervals, between the 12 bells, meaning 55 seconds. But again, I would still argue you need to know that there won't be a 13th one, right? And you would have to wait that extra five seconds, which would be 60 seconds, which is not something we tried, <laughs> admittedly, but given that they keep telling us it wouldn't just be simple math class, and this isn't just simple math class where we multiply the numbers given, um, I highly doubt that's the answer. There's at least one step everyone overlooks at first. Think about what needs to happen in order for you to realize it's 12 o'clock. Hmm. It's not 61, it's not 65. There's one step everyone overlooks at first. Hmm. So, now I'm trying to think... Am I interpreting things right? Each ringing of the bell takes a full five seconds. And then the hint says, there are five seconds between each sounding of the bell. I feel like those are two very different things, right? Um, if, if each ringing of the bell takes a full five seconds, and there are five seconds between each sounding of the bell, that's, that's very different, right? That's a, ten, that's a full 10 seconds. And if that's the case, again, are we still considering the first time you don't hear a bell, right? I feel like that first line of the hint, the bell will ring 12 times and there are five seconds between each sounding of the bell, is just a different phrasing of each ringing of the bell takes a full five seconds, but I feel like they have very different meanings, and if both are true, have very different implications for, for the puzzle. I feel more confused than I did before. <laughs> Think about what needs to happen in order for you to realize it's 12 o'clock. I, 
I think what they're referring to there is recognizing when there isn't another ring afterwards. We didn't try the answer 60, I highly doubt that's it. But if it was, you know, at exactly 12 o'clock p.m. there's a ring, and then five seconds later there's another ring, and then five seconds later there's another ring, right? To get 12 rings, we would have 11 five second intervals, which is 55 seconds, and the 13th ring would come at 60 seconds. And when we don't know, when we don't hear that, that's when, well, we would know that it was 12 p.m. Hmm. Are we supposed to consider somebody ringing the bells? And maybe there's some wordplay going on with you have to recognize it's 12 p.m. in order to ring the bells <laughs> in the first place, but I feel like Zero would have covered that answer, right? We'll try 60. I don't think it's the answer, but if we have this structure of, well, there's you know a bell that's going to ring on the dot at, at noon, and then there are five seconds until the next ring and so forth, and we need to wait until that 13th ring is not there, then, um, then I think we're okay. So I'll, I'll go with 60, but otherwise, I feel like I'm just grossly misunderstanding what the puzzle creator wants me to I think get I got it. from the puzzle. So I don't really... I've let you down, I feel like I'm approaching Professor. it pretty well. Think about this some more. If you could get the right solution by just multiplying information given to you, this wouldn't be a puzzle, it'd be math class. I mean, I agree. Oh boy. Hmm, let's see. What could I be missing about this puzzle? Yeah, I don't know guys, I can't really, can't really think of much else. The only thing, like, is that I don't really believe, but it's sort of like a last-ditch effort, is to kind of combine the wording from the hint and the original problem and say, well, maybe each ringing takes five seconds, and there are five seconds between each ringing, thus ten seconds per ring, and we would know after 120 seconds, well, it'd take 120 seconds to do all 12 rings, and so we would know on the 121st second that there wasn't a 13th ring. So that's what I'm going to go with. At this point, uh, I'm getting frustrated because I feel like I'm more grappling with what does the puzzle creator want me to see, um, rather than coming up with maybe a, a pretty logical solution. Because I felt like I've come at this from a pretty reasonable angle so and just can end up pretty sour, uh, feeling pretty sour about the game as a whole. So I think I'm actually just going to look this one up and I'll do that and I'll offer some comments on it in a moment. Alright, so I just looked it up and basically they're saying that you know on the start of the 12th ring that it'll be... Yeah, that'll, that it'll be the 12th ring, which means you'll know that it's 12 p.m. and so if you consider it ring and then five seconds, ring and then five seconds, that twelfth ring will happen after fifty-five seconds. Arguably, it'll it'll take place on the fifty-sixth second. Yeah, I, don't, I I mean I told you guys I'm somewhat frustrated by this puzzle, but I think it's I don't think it's incredibly well designed. I think the mechanic they were going for is a clever concept, but. I don't think it was incredibly well executed because they don't consider how you know it's not how there isn't going to be another bell coming right and they don't ensure that you're aware that whoever's listening to the time knew the time an hour ago right um how do you know that it's only going to be 12 bells ringing as opposed to 13 or 14 or 15 right um if you knew that there were 11 rings before and it was 11 p.m. then or 11 a.m. then you know on the very first ring here that it's 12 p.m. so even though the solution here is 55 seconds 
I'm gonna be honest, I really disagree with it. Yeah, especially because when they say each ringing of the bell takes a full five seconds, it makes it sound like the duration of the ringing takes place over the course of five seconds. Meaning you would hear the the twelfth bell on the start of the fifty-sixth second. So we'll do fifty-five for the sake of submitting it and, and getting that check mark. I think I've got it. It was fun to think through the different angles Professor, of this problem. But I don't think that this is the correct way of going about it. I mean, we'll read, many people's first instinct is to multiply 5 seconds by 12 rings of the bell, thus coming up with an answer of 60 seconds. The thing is, you'll know it's 12 o'clock the moment you hear the bell ring out for the 12th time. This means you're only really waiting for the bell to ring 11 times. 11 rings times 5 seconds per ring equals 55 seconds. This is how long it takes for you to know the time. Yeah, I... I disagree. Maybe other people can offer some more explanation or, or something to help clarify with that, I'd appreciate it if I'm completely overlooking something, but I think I, I think I explained pretty well why um, I feel the way I do. <laughs> but anyways, let's go to hopefully a more positive note with a fearsome foe. Number 12. There was once a knight, bold and brave. He felled countless opponents and was said to be peerless on the battlefield. However, legend has it that there was one foe that set the knight quaking in his armored boots. The knight feared this monster because of the rumor that surrounded it. It was said that anyone who slew the beast was destined to spill his own blood in the process. Can you guess the identity of this terrifying foe? Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, what? What type of answer am I inputting here? A letter? Ah, uh, I don't like this. Um, so it was said that anyone who slew the beast was destined to spill his own blood in the process. In the process. To spill his own blood in the process. If you slay the beast, right? It's gonna be something like fear, right? Like some emotion or some off the wall. It's not like a, I don't know, Chimera or the Hydra or something like that, right? There was one foe that set the knight quaking in his armored boots. The knight feared this monster because of the rumor that surrounded it. As a quick aside, I really wanna highlight this visualization. <laughs> The monster is a big question mark, and the, the hero's shield also has a question mark, which is pretty cool. Do we get any inclinations to how many letters our answer is going to be, or...? No, I guess not. I was hoping I would move on to a more positive puzzle, Professor Layton! <laughs> This is not what I asked for. Yeah, I'm not really, not really seeing where to go with this one. All I can think of is maybe like himself, maybe his reflection. Like I don't, I don't know, death. It's that line that I mean. I'm sure the key is. It was said that anyone who slew the beast was destined to spill his own blood in the process. So. What would you have to spill your own blood in order to slay, right? If it's an, the first thing that comes to mind is yourself, right? Well, it's technically not necessary. I think I'm gonna take a hint for some more direction. You too may have bested this foe in battle. Your answer should be eight letters long. Now I'm thinking in the lines of like. What is something that you can slay by giving your own blood, right? So I'm, I'm almost thinking in like medical terms now. All right, I'm getting pretty bored of thinking about this one, <laughs> honestly. Um, you too may have bested this foe in battle. I'm thinking like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like gotta be something more positive, right? It's not gonna be like an amputation or like bacteria or surgery or malaria or, or something that involves actually giving your own blood in order to overcome some sort of obstacle. It's got to be something more general 
uh, not as dark <laughs> and something that the average person actually has a chance of encountering. Um, I hope that something, I hope that the phrase to spill his own blood is not metaphorical and I have to take that literally because if it's not, then there's just so little to work with. Um, the only thing I can think of is like yourself. Anyone who slew the beast was destined to spill his own blood in the process. And it's, if it is one large metaphorical thing, um, that's all I can think of. So we'll go with that. And if it's not that, then I will come back to this at another time because <laughs> it's now been, I'm sure I've done some editing to make things convenient for you, but it's now been close to 45 minutes or so since starting this episode. And I've just spent it all uh, thinking about puzzles that I haven't enjoyed as much. Granted, I will say that that first clockwork, you know, clock chime one, it was fun thinking about the different perspectives. And I think what I came up with was pretty cool. I think I'm just more upset about the, uh, the fact that I feel like their solution was incorrect. But we'll, we'll go with yourself and see if that works. Well, here's my guess. Yeah, I didn't think so. I'm so embarrassed. No, think again. This fearsome beast is one you're probably intimately familiar with. I don't know. That's not incredibly helpful. I'll come back to this one later at some point, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I'll think about it a little bit more, but I, no, no guarantees I won't just look it up at some point because I'd rather spend my time on puzzles I'm enjoying. The Vanishing Tower, number 13. Behold the glorious Eiffel Tower, soaring monument to Paris, the city of light and love. At over 1,000 feet tall, the tower is massive, but there is a way to make the entire structure vanish right before your very eyes by using nothing but two coins. How does one accomplish this feat? You put the coins in front of your eyes. <laughs> that's totally what it is. Please let me, please tell me that that's like what we can do. Please tell me this is correct. Please tell me that's the answer. I think I've got it. Oh my goodness, that's that's actually really Professor, funny. I've solved it. Nice job. If you cover your eyes with the two coins, any object will disappear from your field of vision. That is, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. All right, let's move on to the Enigma. The room shown below is perfectly square and completely empty. Okay, although I see some random kid in it. Um, four normal chicken eggs were placed on the floor of the room. Shortly afterward, a man came in with a giant steel cylinder and rolled it all over the floor. Amazingly, not a single egg was broken in the process. Can you guess where these eggs were placed? The eggs used in this problem are standard sized eggs, but have been made larger so that you can move them around more easily. Shortly afterward, a man came in with a giant steel cylinder and rolled it all over the floor. Not a single egg was broken in the process. I appreciate that they say shortly afterward. So it's not going to be some trick like, oh, it's on the man himself, right? I think the idea is that you need to find a spot that will not be... It, well, it comes down to the fact that it's a cylinder, right? And so you have to think about what areas could a cylinder not reach. And I think it's going to be the four corners, actually. When you think about the cylinder, can I, can I draw? No, I can't draw. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, when you think about the cylinders approaching the side of a wall, right? So if we have, if, if you imagine the cylinder approaching one side, not the corner, but one side, when it fully bumps up against the wall, there's going to be a triangle-like space between the cylinder and the, the where the wall meets the floor, right? And so that's going to be kind of like a safe space. But we need to consider that the man could also approach from, you know, 90 degrees opposite that or rotated from that 
along the wall, and so that, spa that space wouldn't actually be safe. So the question is, what space is actually safe? I think it's actually only going to be in the four corners. Because when you approach one of the corners with the cylinder, there will be that little angular, triangular-esque space in the corner. And when you approach it from the other end, there will be still in the corner itself a small space that overlaps with the first triangular space and that'll be the well I, i'd imagine theoretically you could put all four eggs in one corner but i think the idea is it's going to be space for one um <sighs> sorry it's getting kind of late uh it's gonna be spaced where there's only room for one egg so i think it is going to be in the corners anyways let's reread the problem and make sure we're not missing anything the room shown below is perfectly square and completely empty Four normal chicken eggs were placed on the floor of the room. Shortly afterward, a man came with a giant steel cylinder and rolled it all over the floor. Amazingly, not a single egg was broken in the process. Can you guess where these eggs were placed? Yeah, so I think it's going to be in the corners. Hopefully, they're a little bit generous with the placement of the eggs. In terms of indicating that it's, you know, in the corner. Let's give it a go. I think the the reasoning there is good. I think I've got it. All right. Professor, I've solved it. Yep, and there's that sort of triangular space I was trying to talk about. Good thinking. As shown here, there are a few places in the room the big steel cylinder just can't reach. If you place the eggs in the corners of the room, even turning the cylinder on its side doesn't allow it to reach into the corners. Yep, that was that was a pretty neat one. All right, next up, the lost hat. Hopefully it's not Professor Layton's hat. He needs that. It does look like Professor Layton's hat, although I don't see Layton himself there. A river moves at a pace of a thousand feet per hour, and upon that river floats a lone gondola. At precisely high noon, a passenger on the gondola drops his black top hat into the water. The gondola turns around to collect that hat, the hat exactly 100 feet downstream from it. This particular gondola moves at a speed of 20 feet per minute in still water. How many minutes will it take the gondola to meet up with the top hat from the time the hat hit the water? Oh boy, um, let's let's think about this. So can I can I draw? I can. Lovely. So at high noon, the passenger in the gondola drops his black top hat into the water. So at this point, they should be at the same position, right? The next sentence says, The gondola turns around to collect the hat exactly 100 feet downstream from it. Downstream from it. So this is actually worth noting because time elapsed, right? Between dropping the hat and them realizing they need to turn around. Then this... So then they... They've already traveled... They've already gone downstream 100 feet. And then they need to go 100 feet upstream to get it. This particular gondola moves at a speed of 20 feet per minute in still water. Um, the 1,000 feet per water feet per hour I don't think really matters because it's it's affecting both the gondola and the hat. So they're in kind of like the same frame of reference. How many minutes will it take the gondola to meet up with the top hat from the time the hat hit the water? Gotcha. So, it's going to be the 20 feet per minute, right? So five minutes to get back to the hat. But it's also been five minutes since the hat hit the water and they traveled 100 feet from the hat in the first place. So I think the total is actually going to be 10 minutes. Yeah, so I think that's I think that's going to be the answer. Yeah, let's give that a go. 10 minutes. Again, I don't think the 1000 feet per hour really matters because because well, both the gondola and the hat are subject to it. All right. 
The hat will be recovered at 1210. Since both the hat and the gondola are moving the same way on the same river, the river flow affects both items the same way. <gasps> Do you guys see that? They used the wrong effect. Oh no, it should be with an A. <laughs> affects both items the same way, effectively allowing the gondola to travel the same speed as if it were in still water. The gondola traveled 100 feet from that before turning back to retrieve it. This means the boat traveled 200 feet before picking up the fallen hat, since the boat moves at a speed of 20 feet per minute. Total time needed is 10 minutes. Reasonable, but definitely tricky in terms of... They, they very, they're very sly about not mentioning that they traveled 100 feet since initially dropping the hat, right? But anyways. The lazy student. Okay. Let's see what's going on, lazy student. What are you lazing about? A teacher was reprimanding a particular lazy student one day and told him the following. At the very least, you need to study once a day for an entire week before a test. Don't skimp on time either. Each time you study, I want you to study for a minimum of two hours. The boy had no choice but to follow the teacher's orders, but decided he'd spend as little time possible doing so. Assuming the boy followed the teacher's orders exactly, how many hours did he end up studying? So here's here's the key here. I actually see this is this is pretty interesting. Um, the the line each time you study, I want you to study for a minimum of two hours. That's not each day I want you to study a minimum of two hours. Each time I want you to study two hours, and you need to study once per day. So the idea is if your study if your two hour because that's the minimum study session can encompass more than one day you're golden. And so I think the idea is, I don't know, the student starts studying at 11 p.m. on Monday and studies until 1 a.m. on Tuesday. The, he's then cleared Monday and Tuesday and can then study on Wednesday night at 11 p.m. Uh, for, you know, an hour and then an hour Thursday morning until 1 a.m. and then Friday, Saturday, and then um, one hour on Sunday as well. Actually, that's pretty interesting, right? Um, so maybe, because there are seven days, right? So Monday, Tuesday would be two hours. Wednesday, Thursday would be two hours. Friday, Saturday would be another two hours, which would make six hours. Then the question is, what do you do about Sunday? Sunday, he's still got to study. And presuming that that's his one week before the exam, Monday's the exam. you need to have all two hours or both hours in that Sunday. Because if you were to allow anything else, you wouldn't be able to decide just how much time would be on Sunday, right? There would need to be more time on that Monday. Yeah, so I think the, the odd thing here is what do you do about the Monday that comes after this week? I think they want us to only consider this week, right? And so they we have this one last day on Sunday, and that'll be a minimum of two hours. So I think the total is actually going to be eight hours. Let's try that. I think that's what they want us to, to recognize. There we go. Okay, nice. Critical thinking is the key to success. Oh, I've heard that line in a while. Critical thinking is the key to success. Very clever. If the boy simply takes the teacher's orders at face value, he'd have to spend two hours a day studying for a full seven days, thus studying a total of 14 hours. But if he starts studying just before the date changes and finishes two hours later, he can get away with doing a lot less studying. In total, the boy only studies two hours every two days and two hours the last day. So the answer is eight hours. I love that little graphic. That's pretty funny. Okay, uh, next up is image equation. That sounds pretty intriguing. I wonder what this one is. Using the following clues, break the code below and figure out what needs to go in the blank at the bottom of the screen. Huh. So this is pretty interesting. So we have circle X equals shaking hands. Um, okay. Circle square equals that piece of paper. Diamond X 
equals that Sunday, and then up triangle, down triangle equals picking up a suitcase or something? What type of input am I going to be... What? Two words? Is that what they want? Oh my goodness, that is what they want. So I need to get words from each of these pictures. I don't know, guys. <laughs> I don't know about this one. I'm trying to look for similarities between the two circles and the two X's. You know, to see if there's something... Does the X mean there's some th something crisscrossing? I don't even know what, what I would be inputting, right? Like, I need to input two words as the answer to this? I don't know about this one, guys. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't even have anything to really go off of. trying to think like abstractly like the square has something open and is square like x in the top left you know is the crossing of the hands arguably the in the bottom left there's the x of maybe the spoon and that that thing that's in the sunday you know crossing over yeah i'm still at a bit of a loss i'm trying to think in terms of from the shapes I need to be able to come up with two words, right? That describe each picture. And so I'm trying to put a picture together in my head between these, you know, all these different pictures. And it sounds like maybe hiring somebody or becoming friends or going on a date or, or something like that or getting a job. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's the only way I can think of. Maybe maybe the shapes would tell me what would be the next step. And from the story I get from the pictures, I can figure out what the words would be. But I'm getting impatient, so I think I'm going to look at a hint. Look at all the options again and try to figure out what they have in common. Well, duh. <laughs> well, duh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, guys. That's... That hint's not helpful at all. <laughs> Look at all the options and see what they have in common. It's not like I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to it on a fresh mind, but I'll, I'll quit for now. I'd rather end on a, on a more positive note, so let's take a look at chicks and hens <laughs> and see how that one goes. Draw three straight lines between the stakes to divide the chickens into groups. Each group must consist of one hen and two chicks. And only three lines. We're probably This is probably going to be pretty similar to that pen one before. Um, where we had to draw the lines with the, with the pigs. Each group must consist of one hen and two chicks. I wonder if that works in terms of... Like, it's technically on the line, right? Um, so maybe that's a little bit problematic. So I don't, I don't know. I won't rely on that at first. I'll see if there's something else I can do in the meantime. And I'm already starting to see some good divisions here. 
Yeah. Oh, close. <laughs> Very close. This this would be ideal, but I don't know if the chicks are allowed to be on the lines. If they are, then this would do it. But maybe that's a little bit too close for comfort. So I'll think about it again. If I need to group, let's see here. Well, I mean, there are how many chicks, right? There are 12. Um, and I need two chicks per group, essentially, right? And there are six chickens, so I need to create six groups with three lines, meaning these lines will maybe all intersect together in the middle. Yeah, either that, or it'll be similar to what I just made, where there's one line with two lines coming across it. So let's think through that. Um, this, this top left chicken could be grouped either with the chick with the two chicks above it or the two chicks below it or some combination of one chick each. I am again tempted to draw this line here. And then maybe this line here. Am I just redrawing what I've already drawn? <laughs> maybe. I feel like then I would have to do this one here. And that would work as well. Is that what I drew before? Oh, you know what? I think I can draw that more cleanly like this. That's probably what they want. Yeah, I don't see any overlap there. So this 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 should be good. I think I've got it. All right. Professor, I've solved it. <laughs> Nicely done. Now those are some happy chickens. Good stuff. All right, let's uh, let's look at jersey numbers. I want to get through a few puzzles that I'm enjoying. You are tasked with spray painting player numbers onto your team's baseball uniforms. You've prepared 10 paper stencils, each with a number from 0 to 9. With the stencils cut out, you are now ready to paint player numbers on all six jerseys. If each jersey only has room for two horizontally oriented numbers, what's the fewest number of stencils you need to number the six jerseys? Has only has room for two horizontally oriented numbers. I feel like that's relevant, but awkward. I don't know what that means. If each jersey only has room for two horizontally oriented numbers, what's the fewest numbers of stencils you need to number the six jerseys? So I guess, I mean, the idea here is You need to reuse numbers. You need to create six unique numbers with as few stencils as possible. I don't know why they have horizontally oriented numbers. That's that's weird. But um I guess the the six stencil could also function as a nine stencil, which is really helpful. The And so you could use that as six or nine. So we could have one jersey, you know, with the number six, one jersey with the number nine. And then if we had one more stencil, that adds two more numbers to our arsenal. Actually, it adds four, <laughs> right? Because we can just switch the order of the digits. So if we have six and then we have the number nine and then we add, I don't know, let's say the number one, right? We could have 16 and then 61 and then 19 and 91. So all we really need is two stencils. Yeah. The only thing I'm concerned about is, can we fit two digits, right? It says two horizontally oriented numbers, but I don't know if that's, if that means the same thing I'm thinking of. But I think that's, I think that's what they're going for. 
So we'll do two for now. I think I demonstrated how that could be done. Supposedly that's not it, though. I'm ashamed. You need to use as few stencils as possible. You may need to turn everything you know about numbers upside down to find the answer. Do you really only need one? With one, you could create 6, 9, 69, and 96. But not quite enough. Right? Because you could reuse the same stencil on the same jersey. So you could have, you know, the number 6, the number 9, 96, 69. Maybe you could use six, stencil in the six, and then rotate it 180 degrees and spray paint again, and you would have the number eight, actually. So in that case, you would actually only need one. That would be really creative. That would be really creative. I think that might be what they're going for. Let's go with one then. You could make 6, 9, 8, 86, 68, right? Like you could make a, a good amount. That should do it. That's it. Wow. Every puzzle has an answer. <laughs> That's funny. So I didn't even get the right answer for the right reason. Sharp thinking, as illustrated above, either the six... I can't even believe I thought each number had to be unique. You could just re repeat digits. It's so much simpler if it's just six, nine, six, 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 nine, nine, six, nine, nine. Wow. As illustrated above, either the six or nine stencil can be flipped to produce another number. This means you can get the whole job done with just one stencil. And theoretically, you could make eight as well, I guess. <laughs> and thus make quite a few more jerseys if you really wanted. Yeah, so that was my bad on not recognizing that, of course, I could repeat digits in the two-digit number. That's pretty silly, but um, that was a cool puzzle. I like that one a lot. So I think we'll end things off there. I've been recording for quite some time. A lot of that time, dead time thinking about puzzles <laughs> that I didn't enjoy as much, which is unfortunate, but a lot of these weekly puzzles have been cool. We probably only have a handful left, right? There's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then there are the couple that... The fearsome foe. The, the frog. And... That image equation. So, so we'll see. I'm, I'm curious to see what these remaining ones are. Find the volume. If it's as mathy as it sounds like it's going to be... I think I'll like that one, so I'm looking forward to the next round of puzzles. Well, I think we'll try to finish them off in the next one, but until then, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.